This format is one that we actually pioneered at DLD in New York last year. As Steffi says, it's called ping pong, and that's a fancy term for winging it. Um, Mary Lou and I have not prepared for this session at all, <laughs> explicitly. It's not just because we're lazy. And the goal is that we're going to ask each other questions that we have not previewed to each other in kind of a lightning round format with one follow-up allowed per question, and we're going to go back and forth in the time that we have. So I think I drew straws. I get to go first. Shoot. <laughs> I want to read something that I saw on the webpage for your new startup, Open Water. And the first paragraph on the webpage says, what if you could see what was going on in your brain or body with the detail of a high-resolution camera or MRI machine in a simple wearable? And I guess my question is, dude, seriously? Seriously, we're doing it. Uh, we're totally doing it. And I can actually explain really quickly how. Sorry. This is a laser, right? When I put it through my body, it seems like it doesn't go through. Um, it scatters. Here's a, here's a fake little monkey brain. I put it through that, and you see scatter. And here's the thing. Everybody thinks scattering is random. It's not. It's deterministic and reversible. Um, leveraging some manufacturing process improvements that have been put in the trillion dollar manufacturing infrastructure of Asia that makes um, the lowly components in your smartphone, the LCDs and camera chips that have been upgraded for next generation high fidelity VR. And that, um, it's, it's basically Moore's Law, which is the Religion of Silicon Valley, transistor density doubling. <laughs> it's the only religion of Silicon Valley that I'm aware of. Um, it, it's also the only religion that's <laughs> the only religion that's factually correct, right? <laughs> As of a hundred years, yes. Yeah. So doubling the transistor density uh, for screens. What that means is there's this discontinuity in Moore's law. Pixel size approaches the wavelength of light. You can modulate the waves in the wavelength of light. And that means using infrared light that your body is translucent to. In, in the can, same way that that was to the laser, or in a yeah, in analogous yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, if you take your arm, put it up to the sky, and put a detector underneath your arm, the infrared light goes straight through. It just gets scattered. So what we can do is record the phase, the waves and the wavelength of light. We get, by recording the waves and the wavelength of light, we get to use all kinds of four and five syllable words in physics, like interference and diffraction and polarization and holography. And we can record the interference of the holography, mathematically invert it, and then raster scan your body in super high resolution. In fact, we're at a billion times higher resolution than MRI using liquid crystal displays that we make custom and, and camera chips. It's amazing. So I quit my job at Does Facebook. Does anyone actually believe this? this? Does this sound like complete science fiction? What, what, what time frame are we talking about? So developer kits, probably end of this year, early next year, product the year after. We're about a year old startup. So it takes a while to ar architect the things. But I'm not asking you questions. So hey, so I have this question. So I was, we, talked to, we just talked briefly last night at a dinner. Um, so I had to read your website. And I don't have it there. But like. Okay, this jobs thing. <laughs> I watched your TED talk at three in the morning. Your TEDx one, which I thought was better. So, <laughs> well, Every, everyone's a critic. <laughs> it was good. It's really, actually, there's a million views on on it, on just a TED, the TEDx Boston one. Yep. So, so yeah, you were one of the first people, I think, to identify really loudly that there's this jobs crisis, right? That that there's training problem and so forth. So, what's your? How has your thinking evolved? That was. Five years ago, you've been, you know, I, I like the Voltaire quote, vice and, and boredom as well as needs. What's your, how's your thinking evolving on it? Yeah, I think that I was guilty of, of sounding the, oh my heavens, the robots are taking all the jobs alarm a little bit too lo loudly, because that's actually not what's going on. Uh, Bob Gordon is a really good economist, and he's got a beautiful way to summarize it. He says, we don't have a job quantity problem, we have a job quality problem. So unemployment rate in the States is at historic lows. In Europe, the unemployment rate is going down quite quickly. But we're creating this, this, this notion that you hear that, that there is this hollowing out in the middle. This is actually happening. 
happening. The middle class in just about every rich country is shrinking, it's under pressure. We're creating a kind of a small number of upper middle class and better jobs, and we're creating a lot of fairly lousy jobs. And the reason we're creating those jobs exist is that robots are not good home health aides yet. Robots are not good short order cooks. They're not good restaurant busboys. We need human beings to do those jobs, and I think we will for some time to come. Those are not great jobs. They're not prestigious, they're not highly paid, they're not terribly secure. So we, this notion of a polarized economy or a polarized labor force, this is a real thing. Like when farming disappeared, that transition, or is it, you've studied this, is it going to be similar? Or? What was fascinating about all these previous transitions is that they displaced lots of people. Uh, and those people, even within the space of their own lifetimes and their own careers, went on toward better jobs and better careers. The industrial age and every one of the tech transitions in the industrial age brought with it more and more thirst for higher and higher levels of skilled labor. And what's happening this time might actually be different. And that's the reason that I and some other people are trying to sound an alarm, is that we're not uniformly ratcheting up wages and incomes like we did in the past. We're, we're, we're spreading things out. And I think this time might actually be different. So if right now the stuff that comes out of our brain, we've got pretty good input, but basically everything has to come out by moving your mouth and tongue or typing your fingers, can telepathy help for being able to dump ideas, visuals, music, complex emotion, to be able to communicate in much higher bandwidth with each other augmented by the AIs and the robots, can it help? I'm gonna flip this around because this was my next question for you. A again, is this no longer a science fiction, a purely hypothetical question that you just No, asked? I mean, for, for about a decade, dozens of research groups using big MRI machines, functional magnetic resonance imaging yep. machines, that's the MRI machine going in video mode. Stick me into a huge magnet and tell me not to move. Tell you, so, right, so yep. we fixed that with open water, and there's other competing, out. you've got Elon Musk doing something, yep. Facebook, my former employer, who said don't do it, like when I left, they, they, they've got another effort. There's other companies, there's, there's research, and we stand on the shoulders of giants, there's research on this that's been going on in academia for decades, but the last decade or so, the last 10 years, we can pull images and words out of people's heads by just looking at their brain scans in multi-million dollar machines where the grad students, and it is grad students and postdocs primarily, like... Read again, it's so Read people's thoughts, um, see the words they're about to say, the images in their head, their dreams. You gave a TED talk on this in 2015. 14 or 15? Uh, yeah, I, it was my job talk um, to help start Google X, and, I, and Sergey Aqua hired my company. I, I was living in Taiwan making consumer electronics. Um, really cool, Harry Edge of Physics, consumer electronics. Yeah. But yes, yeah, so I gave a talk at so You can watch people's Google. thoughts get recreated on screen. It's messed in up. 2012, I mean, there's like, uh, this was going on, and, and there's, there's so much more work that's been done since then using expensive, clunky, low-resolution MRI scanners compared to what we're, we're the only non-invasive approach. Um, I've actually had brain surgery. I don't see a billion people um, having elective brain surgery in the next five to 10 years. I've got to start up, you know, you've got to fund it in a reasonable kind of exit time. So non-invasively looking in high resolution inside of your head or your body, but in your head right now. So. And when we look inside our heads, we can extract decent bandwidth information about the thoughts that we're having? This yeah, is yeah, by just looking at where, what fMRI does is look at where oxygen is used in your head in 10 millimeter cubic areas, which is about a thousand pixels or, or voxels, which is a 3D pixel in your head, and looking at how your brain reacts to different images or words to create a data store of how you react to it. Okay. And so we and, can- And where, will we, where are we now or where will we be soon with, with the number of voxels? So we can do, we're doing a millimeter resolution, so 10 times that resolution um, using um, Oxy, looking at the use of oxygen. We do it in a slightly different way. 
where in MRI, it's a big magnet and the, the spin of the subparticles changes whether the, the blood is carrying oxygen or not. In our case, since we're using infrared light, the color of blood is different oh. whether it's carrying oxygen or not. So we just use two lasers. It's actually a lot easier. But we get exactly those same results. But here's the thing, this last summer, we, were, we spent the time in the lab. I bought the first year of funding to look at the limits of the physics. And we thought, can we go further than the resolution of MRI? And, and we did. We went a lot further. We're at a billion times higher resolution than MRI, looking at neurons themselves. And neurons communicate, everybody thinks, electronic, electrically, mm -hmm. with uh, pulses going down the axon of a neuron. But before that electrical pulse goes down, the membrane roughens. And uh, that is... Wow. Scattering. Like if I took sandpaper and put it over my glasses, that's roughening and that causes scattering. And since we've neutralized the scattering of the body, we can see the differential scattering of the neurons. So we can get neurons directly, non-invasively. And you need a supercomputer in the background to do the processing required to extract the information from that? No. Because no. <laughs> we can focus the light. So we, we make a hologram of your scatterer like in a, in a camera chip. Like We need one micron pixels. This is an old phone. Like old, it's like four years old. Um, and it has one micron pixels in, in the camera. I actually, probably every single cell phone in the audience already has one micron pixels. That allows us to record the hologram of the scattering. Then we mathematically process it and put it on a, a custom LCD that I've designed that has one micron pixels, which is kind of tricky design, but doable with the manufacturing process improvements, and we're doing it. And um, then you shine light on it, and then you can focus the light and raster scan the body wherever you want to. So this is using the trillion dollar, relatively empty manufacturing um, uh, uh, capability that already exists in Asia that, that can ship in very high volume at, at, at good cost. And in fact, the cost of this is related basically to one factor, how many units we ship per month. Yep. So we can go mainstream. So the implications for healthcare are pretty profound as well because $50 billion of revenue for MRI scans just in the U.S. alone last year, $2,700 a pop. And... Um, wow a lot of people aren't well served by that. Like, if you have a stroke and you happen to live close to an MRI machine or have the stroke close to it, you can get scanned and find out what drug you should take, whether it's a clotting kind of stroke or a burst kind of one. And you don't have to lose your speech or anything with a stroke if you can get the right drug immediately. So this can go into ambulances to check people out, things like that. Doctor's offices, even in your home. Walgreens, you know, I'm just sorry. Any, any pharmacy, sorry, I'm not trying to pick on <laughs> chemist shop whatever are we all on our phones shorting any stock that we have in mri equipment manufacturers so that, would it enable i mean the company is called open water a, a friend of mine a, a rock star literally a rock star peter gabriel called me every week for six months trying to convince me to quit facebook so i could talk about the implications of this there's profound ethical implications for this right but um he called it open water, because he wrote this lovely essay about it. If you Google Peter Gabriel and open water, you can find it. And because he thinks that we'll all start, um, some of us will start letting our minds totally swirl with each other without the filters on, like, because sometimes people think of sex or violence, but don't say it, or, you know, things like that. Like, what is society and civilization changes, but also, it seems inevitable that we want the communication bandwidth, and it seems inevitable that with that, we are capable of much more. But apparently, I'm not saying anybody's lying, but we hear 20 different lies a day. Like, I don't look fat in this dress, or like, or like little things that are not, oh, that really tastes so delicious, and you know, you I'm a big fan it. of your work. <laughs> <laughs> I am, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of thing. So what happens? Can you imagine human resources in any different company if everybody was honestly had their brain out on the table? And That's the single most terrifying thought I've heard in a long, long time. <laughs> You're not comfortable? I'm so uncomfortable <laughs> with that, right? Because the more I know about my brain is, A, I spend a lot of time lying to other people. 
as do, as do we all, let's be honest, and B, my brain spends a lot of time lying to me. It's this incredibly deceptive organ. I'm not really sure I want all that out in the open. But wouldn't it be great to be able to, you know, dump your book? <laughs> Without, like, the pain or the... You know. <laughs> or, like, I think in images... Good, good God, my unfiltered thoughts would be, the, would be the worst book ever written. Oh, right, right, right. So in images, or if, like, like a movie director waking up with an idea or a scene or dumping her dream directly to video and then yep. getting around with the crew saying, I know we're going to shoot this today, but, you know, I had this different idea. Ignore the girl in the nightgown. That's me. But something like this, could we do this instead? It's just such a faster way to communicate with people. No, I mean, really, like, you could get words <laughs> out of your head. Seriously. I mean, we think visually, and we can only communicate at this slow baud rate with words or with typing rate, sometimes drawing, but, you know, you could... And, and you are firmly convinced that particular constraint is going to be eased within a decade? Yeah, okay. uh, five years. Five, I, five years? Five years, yeah. Um... Okay, while I'm processing the implications of that, you can try to ask me a question, and I'll think my answer back at you. <laughs> so what else are you working on other than the joblessness stuff? <laughs> <laughs> other than this like, really depressing strain of stuff that you do. Uh, here, here, here's a happy, here's an optimistic thing that I'm working on that I still find hard to believe, but um, we've been banging on it fairly hard, and I think it's true. Um, we are, in, in the rich world, even though our economies are growing, even though there are more people year by year in countries like America, and even though we have not turned our backs on wanting things, on wanting to consume, year by year we are consuming fewer of most of the resources out there in the natural world. Not per person, in aggregate, fewer and fewer resources. So it, it, I think we have finally decoupled economic growth and growth and affluence from beating the hell out of our planet to, to satisfy ourselves. Now, there's one big exception to that, obviously, which is we're still cooking our planet and we need to stop. But for example, global uh, carbon emissions have kind of plateaued in the past three or four years and they're gonna start heading down. Again, not quickly enough, not time to get complacent, but this, throughout the industrial age, what we humans did was gouge and plow and cut down and beat up the earth to satisfy ourselves. I think we're finally getting out of that business. We're going to take better care of our planet going forward. That's awesome. So will we start to engineer climate control? Actually, I met some people that are stealth doing it um, at this conference that I was fascinated by, but it seems that that's pretty taboo, yet uh, could accelerate uh, the correction. How do you come down on that? I, I don't know enough to have a strong opinion on that. I talk to people who are big advocates of geoengineering and say, look, we just throw, I'm, this is horrible science, so uh, enough dust up in the sky, it will reflect back enough of the, sun, of the radiation from the sun that we will slow down the rate of cooling at a fairly low cost in every sense of the word. All right, that, that, that sounds pretty good. It doesn't solve all the problems, and the people who know about this that I talk to, they're probably most worried about acidifying our oceans because that is very hard, it's extremely hard to reverse, and some of the most fragile ecosystems in the oceans, coral reefs are a great example, really don't like the greater levels of acidity and lots and lots of fish spawn in coral reefs. Uh, I, I'm a diver, I love to go look at coral reefs underwater, so I would be super unhappy if they went away. There are more profound reasons to get upset about that. So by far the best thing for us to do, that, right, than, than my leisure preferences, uh, but by far the best thing for us to do is to slow down the rate at which we are cooking and, and adding these greenhouse gases. The, the frustrating thing for me is that we have the technology to do this. So there are a couple different paths forward. Some people are crazy about nukes, some people are not crazy about nukes. Either way, we could do it if we summoned the willpower right. to actually decrease our, our, our carbon emissions. And it's yeah. everyone that I talk to, it's technologically, it's like, it's right here. Everyone that I talk to who knows about this is just has the sense of frustration that that we know the problem we know the path forward and and here we sit right I mean the cars are part of it and I think China will lead in that because they've said 20 48 volt stop start 
um, no more internal combustion engine. Yep. And they have the wherewithal to make that happen. But if, if we're putting dust in the atmosphere, why not just have more clouds? Because clouds are white, so they reflect light. Like I remember in the year 2000 being really shocked that the climate change science this is as an optics PhD, didn't include ah. the optics. Like, mm -hmm. they were like, whoa, if you paint this white instead of black, it changes, and I was just shocked. But like, the correction was made, whatever, 18 years ago. Um, but if we had things that were more white, they would reflect the light, and it, black absorbs heat, white reflect mirrors as well, but can we make just more clouds? Like I'm going to black. dodge that question entirely because I'm not even going to pretend to know enough to answer that one. And but, I want, but I want why to the dust? The dust is is is. I guess because a lot of us don't want to live under cloudy skies all the time. But the the dust is white too. I presume that they're injecting the thing that you. I'm punting about. on this question. Okay. I can't all right, stress all right, this enough. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm just because yeah. I understand the optics. In the time that we have left, I want to ask you. We, I think what? we have time for one more each. Um, you were part of the founding team for one laptop per child. Yep. which was a very important and very controversial chapter in the history of computing. What's, in your, your view, what's the legacy of one laptop per child? We won. We went from being accused of it being totally impossible and a joke by Bill Gates and Steve Jobs and Michael Dell to um, I co-founded with Nicholas yep. Negroponte, my much more famous co-founder, a startup with a billion dollars of revenue, got thrown out of MIT for doing it, but they said, get it out of your system, come back. We catalyzed $30 billion of revenue for our for-profit partners and became the fastest growing consumer electronic category ever recorded and transformed the lives of, with our units and the competing units, um, 100 million children in the developing world. So 10 years later, tablets, the average cost of a tablet, you can go to Alibaba right now and buy a tablet, a white box, an unlabeled tablet for 20 bucks. And in fact, almost every country in the world is signed up to doing that for their children by 2020. So we went from impossible titans of industry saying it'll never work, it's a joke, to done in 15 years. And is that your legacy or the legacy of, again, the smart, this trillion dollar smartphone industry? Well, the smartphones didn't exists well at least not apples at that time there was you know there were others there were other smartphones that were called smartphones at the time um, the consumer electronics industry exists to make consumer electronics which are you know televisions and radios and then laptops and and so forth um, so we you leverage if you're going to put something into production Bad idea if you have to make a $5 billion factory, raise that money, and maybe ship five years later. Because like, there's just no way that you can compete on a cost structure or volume with the existing manufacturing industry. It's why I left MIT. As yeah. good as the labs were there. Mary Lou, I have to cut you off because our, our clock is blinking oh, right, at right, us. Right, right. And, and we're going to try to be good panelists and stick to our That's schedule. That's right. OK. But this has been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.